Hi, welcome to Into ETV. I'm Peggy Robinson. Today's guest is Maddie Co. Frederick, and she's had a near-death experience and has had quite a a childhood. Where I think we're gonna get into and to learn to what she's why she's doing what she does today. <laughs> right? Does that sound right? Yes, okay. that's right. So start where you like and take as long as you like. Oh my gosh! Thank you. So, oh, I am. Yeah, I had a near death experience when I was 29 years old. And that's, it's funny because that's not really where my story starts, but it's where I started. It's where I got the motivation um, to, to do the work I'm doing today and to kind of, I guess, be who I'm meant to be, you know, to, to the extent I'm able to. Um, I think we're all trying to expand into more of who we're meant to be, right? And and be that that beautiful reflection of the divine. We're always trying that to our best. So yeah, when I was 29, I had a near-death experience. I had no idea it was happening to me because I was at home when it happened. And interesting. So for me, when you die, you're supposed to be in the hospital because I used to work in a neurosurgery trauma intensive care unit. So for me, death is something that you like fight against, right? <laughs> you're like really trying to save somebody or you're like letting them go peacefully with their family and hospice and all that. So to, to realize that, you know, at 29, you can just die at home. And I had, you know, gotten injured and things like that, but I didn't realize, you know, I, I just, I don't know. For me, it was, it was such a shift of my belief of what death was. And when it happened, it's funny because I didn't know what was happening, right? I didn't have this thought like, oh my gosh, I'm dying. I wasn't afraid. I just remember feeling like I couldn't breathe. And like there was this iron weight sitting on my chest and breathing was like this, it was it was like just lifting this weight up and down and it was so hard. And I remember I got to this point where I just thought, well, I think I'll stop, right? Because breathing is really kind of overrated and this what is hard. What your injury? What injured you? So I had a couple things going on. Um, one was I'd contracted Lyme disease three weeks before the injury and I had no idea. I was living in Lake Tahoe and got bit by a tick, didn't think a thing of it, didn't really even, Lyme disease was not on my mind living out West. And um, long story short that I don't get super into, I had gotten injured by somebody practicing, practicing a type of medicine with no license and no schooling. And I had no idea. And I don't get into that story because it really triggers people and it like becomes this revenge thing. And I've, I've gotten people really, they get angry when they hear about it and they want to know. And I don't want to focus on that person, right? That's not, they mm -hmm. don't get any, they don't get any time in my life. So people do get stuck there. I know. I, I don't want to get stuck there. I don't want to trigger anybody else. And I've seen it be a trigger. So let's just say I got injured. I was really injured, really sick. Um, and, and I, um, so I'm having this experience where I can't breathe. Right. And it's, it's just, it's too, or it's just like, it wasn't that I couldn't breathe. I could, it was just so hard with like this huge weight on my chest. So I'm struggling. I decide let's just stop. And when I decided to stop, again, somewhere I knew I was going to take my last breath and that I wouldn't live, but I never thought I was dying. And then when I did stop, you know, I think our sense of humor, or our personality kind of comes with us. I don't know if it's the same with you, but when I did stop breathing, my first thought was, oh, that's better. Breathing is so overrated. You know, and I'm like, Whoa, that's better. And I remember feeling like, oh my gosh, I'm so, you know, I feel better. I feel alive. That's why when I drowned when I was little, I was struggling oh, and choking. And then I was like, well, there's no such thing as drowning. I'm fine. <laughs> like, it's so much better. Like, what am I worried about, right? <laughs> I think, you know, I didn't talk about my NDE until fairly recently because I did kind of have this sense of humor about it. And when it first happened, everybody around me was so serious and they wanted to know. And I just felt a lot of pressure. And I was pretty, still pretty young at 29 and I didn't know how to handle it. And so... And now I'm comfortable with it. And I just realize it's, it's, yeah, we are, our, our essence carries through forever, right? The essence of who we are. And if you have a sense of humor, then that's good. That's like, God has a sense of humor. And if you haven't figured that out yet, you know, you're not paying attention. <laughs> so That was abused as children tend to take a sense of humor with serious things because yeah. our family didn't take things seriously. They didn't care. So it's right. not like you're going around. Oh no, look, I got a hang now. Everybody take care of me. It was just like, ah, <laughs> right, <laughs> she'll be all right. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, um, anyways, I, so when I stopped breathing, I saw this beautiful light 
And it was interesting because I couldn't stop looking at it. It was like I was fixed on it, focused on it. And I couldn't look away. And it was the other thing. It was so bright. It was like, I, I described it like a thousand suns, like shining directly at me. It didn't feel too bright. And it felt also familiar, like it had always been there, but I'd kind of forgotten about it. So that was interesting. And I remember after that, just kind of saying goodbye to my family, but it wasn't goodbye. I actually just remember feeling this immense love and gratitude to them or for them. Um, my wolf dog that was there, my husband, my parents, my sister, I just felt so much love and gratitude to everybody. And then after that, I went to the other, what I call the other side of the veil, because in reality, it's like this thin veil between our reality here on earth and the ultimate reality as, as you know, on the other side, if, if you want to call it that. So um, when I was on the other side, that's when things got interesting. That's when I started to have my life review. And yeah, up until that point, I'd never really known anything about near-death experiences. I had never heard anybody's. I, I really didn't know much about it. I didn't know anything about it, to be honest. Um, yeah, so I went through my life review and, um, you know, really it was just blissful up until I was about four or five years old. And then at five years old, and this is what really made me kind of like straighten up and come back and try to like be a good person. Not that I wasn't good, but I came back and in that experience, I was being mean to a friend of mine in when we're five years old. <clears throat> and I remember getting into this thing where I was being mean to her on purpose. And interestingly enough, you know, like the universe doesn't miss anything. Everything we do, say, feel, think, we're accountable for all of it. And in that moment, I was being mean to this little girl on purpose and I was hurting her feelings on purpose. And I was being shown what I did in that moment. And of course, you know, the universe, God isn't judging us. There was no judgment. I felt the judgment. I was judging me. I was experiencing it as myself and as this little girl, Sherry. And I felt what she was feeling and what I was feeling and then that unconditional love of God all at the same time. And I went through that with every, excuse me, of course I'm an eyelash here. Um, I went through that with every moment in my life that was, you know, a bigger moment, not like every time I tied my shoes or, you know, ate, but any, any. Was big this decision. fast, like a movie being shown? What was that like? It didn't feel fast because I think when we go to the other side, there's no more time. Like it's not, there's no linear time or at least in my experience. So it didn't feel fast to me. In fact, the entire experience, people have asked me like, how long were you there? And how long, you know, and I don't know. I was, I was not attached to a monitor. Um, it felt like I was there for hundreds of years. I mean, if you could put a time on it, it was like you're in infinite time. And that was only, that was just the beginning part. That wasn't my whole experience. This is just like the, the you know, life review before you really go into that, the, or at least where I went. Um, so I, I completed my life review and I realized, I think the biggest thing I realized in that moment is, you know, we are here, we have an assignment on our, our soul. We are here for something and it is important to live it, whatever that is, you know, and do a good job. And we are accountable for our, our actions and our thoughts. And um, I think it's important to live a meaningful life, an intentional life. So after that experience, I was, you know, everything, I just remember after that is when my real death experience happened or when I really wasn't connected to, to this life anymore, because I remember just getting, I'm probably mixing it up, but I remember getting downloaded with new information and there was these four guides there, four souls, four beings. And I wouldn't say they were human. I wouldn't say that they're like, relatable right and I couldn't see them but I could see them with my soul and they were just pure love and joy and bliss and just you know I, as I as I put it in my book if if I could if they did that to me now if they had me feel that now it would explode me because it's just too much to to experience in our human in our human body um, but what I felt was like this very intense moment where they were like downloading me with new information and it was just very quiet and very peaceful. And after that, it was like, okay, it was like, it was like somebody gave me a box and was like, here, but you can't open it. Like I couldn't figure out how to open. It. I didn't know what it was. It was just this box. And so I just carried it around for, you know, a long time after I came back, I had no, I didn't really want to think too much of it. I didn't know what it was, but after that experience, I remember getting, um, I remember, well, so I, 
Boy, so it was, I'm trying to condense this whole experience into just a short time. I know you said take your time, but oh yeah, take your time. I remember getting pulled, like my attention got pulled into this light. And so I started focusing on this light and where I was before that moment was just bliss, right? I was just merging with these beings in bliss. And all of a sudden there's this light that grabs my, my human attention. Right. And I kind of am interested in that. And I see this shadow of a being falling through what looks like a circle of light. And I'm like, and so I asked not with human words, but I asked, you know, what is that? Who is that? And they said, it's you. It's the part of you that gets attached. And it was interesting. And I, it, it just kind of fell through and we watched it in silence. And I just remember feeling like, wow, I am not Modico. I was never Modico. I was never like all of all the things I cared about. I was a big rock climber at the time. I was totally into climbing and hiking and all that. And all of that just, and I was practicing alternative medicine myself and all of that dropped away. All the identity of who I thought I was, was gone. And I just felt like I'm me. I'm like, this is who I am. This is who I'm meant to be. I'm love. I'm bliss. I'm joy. I'm peace. And, you know, that when you think about it now from where you're at, isn't it so strange to think about you were at a place where you no longer had a body, you no longer had your career, your home, your family, you're completely, I mean, it might as well be jail in a way because you are completely removed from society. Only you're in this other realm and you know, you're no longer on earth and you're in this other place. And sometimes I just like am in awe of, I was there, you know, isn't that so strange to be, I've been there. You're not supposed to know about there until you're there. And then to come back, I don't know. I'm sorry. I just got off on a no, thing it's, there. It's, it is. It's a trip. It's wild. And and then there's a part of us. I think, I think we all come, I don't know, but I feel like I came back with the other understanding that we're always there. We're never not there. We're not disconnected from that part of ourselves. That's the truth of who you are as a soul. That's the oneness with God. You're not separate from that. Right. But we got to experience it in its entirety. And then you come back to this little tiny human existence. And it's like, <laughs> what is going on here? This is like, you know, we think this is the ultimate reality because we're living in, it feels very real, like kids and mortgages and taxes all feel. And the ego comes back. Oh my gosh. The ego comes back. Like, let me be in charge. You know, I always say that the ego's full-time job is to keep us from God consciousness. That's its job is to make sure we don't, you know, get too enlightened um, so that it's, it can survive. And I think the ego can be used in a good way too, to like get things done. So it's not, all bad or good. It's just, you want to use your ego and not let your ego, you know, use you. Um, but yeah, I just, I had the most, so that's when I was just like expansive and just going, Oh my gosh, this is who I am. I'm, and I just felt like I was there for like, you know, seven, 800 years, just like in that bliss. And then I hear this voice saying, you have to go back. It's not your time. And I was like, I'm going to ignore that. <laughs> You know, I'm just in the bliss. And again, they said, you have to go back. It's not your time. You have to go back and help people. And I threw like more of a vibration. I call it thought waves because it's not language. It's just this, it's a thought that moves through with feeling. And I said, no, like I'm home. I don't want to go. Then they explained to me that, you know, each soul, each person has a time that they're meant to go and you can't go before or after your time. And this is not your time. You have to go back and help people and remember who you are. So at that point I was like, okay, I'll serve. I want to go back. Yeah. And then I couldn't <laughs> just, what do, how do I do that? Like, is there a directions or, you know, how do you do that? And I remember being like this feeling of being pushed, like they're pushing me from behind, which is interesting because there is no front back forward, you know, but that's what it felt like anyways. And then I sort of like slammed back in my body, took a breath. I was in so much pain. And um, now what did you done? You just started having this pressure in your chest all of a sudden and it went out. Mm -hmm. And then now you're back and now I'm back. The pain. I'm sure I left out some bits, um, but I'm in like just complete pain everywhere. It felt like I'd been run over and probably because I was not breathing. Right. So that would hurt. Um, and my husband was there and kind of, I felt something on my face and it, he was like kind of slapping me and trying to bring me back. And, and he had just found me. And, uh, I remember when I took that breath, I just, the first thought was I have to go to the hospital. 
And then they brought me back under or in or up. I'm not sure. They brought me back to that beautiful place and said, don't use Western medicine. What do you mean they brought you back to that place? They brought like, me back to that bliss. Like, like you you like had another NDE? I wouldn't say I had another NDE, but it was almost like they, I came back and then I was going to go to the hospital and they're like, let's just chat really quick. Right. So they brought me back into the bliss. Okay. I mean, not to use Western medicine. And again, you know, maybe you've heard this before, experience it, but when they tell you something, it's not like they're telling you and you can hear it and forget about it. Or, you know, it's like they tell your A man. Friends. Yes. They just, they put, they, in, they embed you with it. Mm -hmm. So, and coming from a background of Western medicine and, and Eastern medicine, you know, I was, I was going to listen because they know me, right. They know us and they know I can be kind of stubborn and not listen. So <laughs> they really wanted to make sure I listened. And I, I didn't, it was really hard because I was sick and I went through so many different holistic and eventually Western doctors just to see what happened. And it took so long. And I just eventually healed, um, on my own and uh, not on my own, but through the help of alternative practitioners. And then I found a wonderful doctor who's both, um, a naturopath and a medical doctor. And she was like the perfect fit for me. Um, and this was years later, three and a half years later, I'd recovered from the incident and I had at that point, third stage Lyme disease. It was in my brain. I was having mini strokes and absent seizures and I was still really sick. So I didn't have this great, you know, NDE and come back and like get healthy. And it just, it took a decade. So you me. didn't go to the doctor right after this, but it was three years before you found out you had third no. stage Lyme disease. Yeah, no, in those three years, I actually saw 16 different people from okay. medical doctors to, to Western, but I didn't go to the hospital in that moment. I actually took five weeks and this, again, it's like, you know, God has a plan here. I go to the doctor. I find this doctor. He just moved to town. My husband met him and his wife and they just moved to town. He was opening a practice. And so we went to see him. And at this point, he doesn't even have his office built out yet. So he's got an office out of his house and eventually had a very nice office. But this was like they'd been here like a couple of weeks. Well, he had had an NDE eight years earlier. So when I told him, they said, don't use Western medicine. He's like, we're not doing it. <laughs> I'm not going to do anything. But he ran some lab tests to see, you know, what may have happened to me and, and to come up with some idea. So that was helpful. But in the end, Western medicine wasn't what healed me. Um, but later, three and a half years later, I went to a lot of doctors who told me, you know, as I kept getting sicker, they would say, you're making it up. It's all in your head. And um, or they just would admit they couldn't help me. They didn't know it was wrong. And again, that was just kind of part of my journey. And um, then I found this woman who really did help me and, and help me heal. And it did take, you know, I would say it took a full decade. What kind of doctor was she? She was a naturopath and family medicine doctor. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And her husband's a neurologist. And so um, they both were just really helpful for me. Yeah. And I got, I got healthy from the Lyme, which it's fun. I'm kind of like her miracle patient because I was so sick. She actually thought at one point I wouldn't be able to do much more than like take a pottery class. Um, because I was so impaired. I mean, I couldn't, I couldn't turn on my cell phone. I, I was so sick. You know, I went from running my own practice in Chinese medicine and, and even working in an ICU at one point to not being able to turn on my telephone to call for help. I couldn't turn a doorknob to get out to call for help. I was really, really sick. So um, she was just the perfect fit for me. Okay. Yeah. So where'd you go from there to do? I mean, cause you got a big deal going on now, don't you? Kind of. This, yeah. Uh, I'll let you tell about that. Oh yeah. So I have a book. I, I, you know, it's funny cause I wrote the book 10 years ago. Interesting. Right. When our daughter was born um, and we adopted her from India. So I hadn't met her yet. I didn't know who she was. Didn't even know I was going to adopt. I mean, I kind of knew I was going to adopt, but you know, I hadn't started the process yet, but it was interesting around the same time that she was born is when I wrote the book um, called soul priority. And it does go through in detail my near-death experience and the download that I got. Eventually, I open up into what that is, as I call it, the four soul archetypes. But I also created or founded my own healing modality called astral therapy. And um, that's been just phenomenal. I've been able to help people through, you know, it's through a visualization, but I, I call it travel. So travel into the higher realms where we go, you know, after we die and even before we're born to heal the wounds that are inflicted that we come across during our human experience um, and to decondition these limiting human beliefs that we have. There's a lot of things that I think we believe that aren't really true. 
And we have a lot of limiting beliefs around, you know, money, around relationships, around a lot of things. And so I help people clear that so that they can live and what I call live their soul assignment. You know, when I was little, my mom was always saying that rich people are mean and selfish. And so it kind of put in your head, don't you ever be rich? Yeah, because then you're mean and selfish. Yeah. Yeah. You know, my dad, I was thinking about the other day and my dad, who he's had both, my, both my parents have passed away now and they were older when they had me, but he would, it was interesting if he saw a wealthy car, like a, you know, Maserati or something. And we grew up in, in California. It was like, or Ferrari cut you off. That person thinks they own the road, right? Well, if it's a middle-class person driving a Honda, oh, they're just, <laughs> just they're asleep at the wheel. You know, it's just a mistake. It's okay. If it's a poor car, oh, they don't know what they're doing. I mean, it's just loaded with judgment, <laughs> right? And so as little children, we get conditioned to believe, well, I don't want to think I own the road, but it's okay if I just make a mistake. So I'll just stay middle of the road, right? Interesting how, so those are some of the, the, the beliefs. I mean, that's just one small belief, but I do work a lot around money mindset. And, you know, I really... I finally become unapologetic about it, but I want people to be able to make good money living their soul assignment. I don't believe that we should be living separate from what our soul is here to do, from what God sent us here to do. I think we should be earning money through our gifts. And I don't think there's anything wrong with abundance because abundance, that was one really fun thing. When I went into the, when I died, I realized, you know, we put money in like a cage and we lock the door and we say we can only have so much of it. But when re reality is abundance is everywhere, you can have as much as you want. It's just our limiting belief that, you know, we're only allowed so much. You have to work hard, whatever we believe. It's not true. Yeah. The times in my life where I started making more money or my husband's make more money or we'd save more money or paid off our house or whatever, those things, I felt very uncomfortable. Interesting. That's not my identity. Yeah. Yeah. My and identity yeah, is good. paycheck to paycheck, struggling and never getting there. I don't know how to deal with this. That's not me. No. Interesting, right? And we live in a world of infinite abundance. God is infinite. He's not he, she, however you want to put God. I'm not here to change anyone's religion. I'll just say he for ease. He's not limited. So why are we as children of God? How are we so limited? Right? And yet we do, we limit ourselves. But they, I mean, it, we even know we can have and do everything like Jesus told us that he wasn't like, well, I did this, but you can't. No, you can't have that. I mean, that was only for me. You know, I said that, right? But we tend to act like you did <laughs> or whatever religion people are. Like we tend to limit ourselves because I, as I joke with my clients a lot, I'm like, quit acting so human. Like you're a divine being with infinite potential. Go act like that, right? But it's, it is, it's our traumas. And, you know, I had some childhood abuse too. And it, it really can inhibit us from living our soul assignment and feeling worthy of our soul assignment. You know, sometimes people know exactly what they're here to do and they just, they have wounds and they can't do it. And so I, I love going in and helping people kind of clear that up because it's life is too short. Like you need to be doing what you're here to do. You know, it's not, you can die with this, with an assignment on your soul, but it's better if you don't, because there's a plan for you. God has a plan and you're meant to do this. So that's what I want people to do. And I think like all of humanity will just do better. We'll, we'll stop fighting so much and there's so many problems in this world, but I feel like if we lived and worked and even earned our income through our soul, I think it would be a better place. So that's, that's what I'm trying to do. I'm not sure if I clearly understand what you're doing, but what I'm thinking about is um, after my five-year-old into even drowning, went to pre-Sunday school and I, I know people that are me talking about, it, but um, um, teacher said, get a coloring page and sit down. And so I get a coloring page and I'm like, as I'm starting to pick it out, I'm like, there's one I'm supposed to get, like just one. And I go through the pages. That's not it. It's like, oh, this is the one. This is the one. And I sit down and I start coloring. And as I'm cut, it's a picture of Jesus sitting on a rock and two children beside him and one on a lap. And I'm singing, Jesus loves me over and over and over. I'm getting all wound up. Mind you, I just had an NDE and of course, don't know what that is. And I'm this real spiritual kid after this. And so I'm getting wound up. Suddenly I'm in heaven. And the exact scene is there. Jesus sitting on a rock, the two kids, and one else like, only it was real. I was standing, not just coloring now, looking at it. I'm standing in front of Jesus, and this is actually happening. 
Yes. And so when you say that about visual, visualization, and I think about all the NDEs people have and what they see and what they hear is different from this one than this one. It's like what we're meant to have. And But what come to me is I'm standing there looking, I'm thinking, I want to push that kid off that's on Jesus' lap because I want to sit on his lap. It's like waiting to sit on Santa Claus' lap. You got to yeah, wait yeah. your turn and you can't wait. Sure. And I'm like, I'm this kid feeling so bad because I want to push that kid off. And I'm sitting in front of Jesus and he's looking right at me, smiling like he knows what I'm thinking. And I'm feeling guilty, but yet I can't help myself. <laughs> and I feel Jesus look at me and kind of grin. you like, you earn everything. <laughs> And then I hear a voice, not Jesus, but I hear a voice say, Jesus loves children of every color. Never forget that. And, you know, as I go through life, this memory keeps popping up. I think it makes no sense. And when I started talking about my NDE, I thought, I don't want to tell that. This sounds so childish. It sounds so made up. It doesn't sound possible. How could that be real? But then when I hear what you're doing, and I'm thinking about visualization, and I'm thinking, that's what God's doing. We have these NDEs. He's providing a visualization. And I think, you know, when I heard those words, there's like a certain picture I'm to get. And that's, this is the right one. It's like it already was set up. Like this was going to happen. But what I gained out of that was this love for Jesus. Mm -hmm. And to th that love he had for children, I could feel it. And what did I have my whole life? This love for children. It's just yeah. like that it was just ingrained in me. And then, you know, some things were said to me during the drowning that just made me realize I want to love unloved children. I want to love kids like me and love kids. And so it was like, you know, now that I'm a great grandma, I look back and I was like, this was all set up. It mm -hmm. was all meant to be. Mm -hmm. You were given this experience and this experience and this and this and this. And I think all our lives have to be that way. It's kind of like when you buy a puzzle and you see the picture on the front, how it is when it's finished. Mm -hmm. and is this that puzzle and throws all the floor there's your life go pick them up <laughs> yeah yeah and then at the end you get the visualization you see the whole picture you see yeah. all of it and it makes sense and there was no mistake yeah even the abuse even the traumas even all the hardship we go through you know you can use it for good you know or you can be a victim of it but i believe that when you use it for something good like you have it just, it just expands everybody around you and it, it helps elevate the world. You know, it's such a beautiful, it's such a beautiful life, even though it's, even though it can be so heavy, it's just so beautiful, you know? Yeah. And we can be, you know, at the verge of suicide time at times, you know, and that we're given free will. We can do that at any minute. Yeah. I mean, when I was 16, I just all of a sudden got this burr up my butt and it was at night and I walked her in front of semi and I thought, come on, come on. I could, couldn't get to her quick enough. And all of a sudden my friend grabbed me like, where'd she come from? You know, she was over at this payphone. How'd she get to her that quick? And she grabbed me, you know, I think back like, yeah, it could have been like that. And so many other things in my life, you know, there's near misses, there's yeah. almost accidents. Like how did that not happen? Yeah. And I hear them all the time, you know, yeah. or my podcast or anybody else's. The, just like the hand of God, just nope, not for you today. Not your time. And then other people, that was their day. The strangest, quirky, like a tick, you know, dying right. from a tick. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's actually from something else. The tick happened too. But yeah, it just, even still, it wasn't my time. Even if I had gotten hit by a car or whatever, it just, it wasn't my time. They weren't going to let me go. So then I had this rational thought of like, well, I don't have to go to the doctors or the hospital because they're not going to let me die anyways. It's not my time. So I guess I'm good to go. <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's, uh, I think, I think, you know, if there's one message I have, yes, I love helping people live their soul assignment, find out what that is and, you know, do it for a living. But I think really it's about living an intentional life, slowing down enough in this very crazy, busy world to connect with your soul. Really, that's all I want for people. Just connect with your soul. However that happens, prayer meditation, you know, I don't know. There's so many things out there nowadays. It's just, however that works for you, that's worthy. Wish, that is what you should spend your time doing. Cause that's yeah, the only wish, thing with yeah, you. Yeah. Oh, sorry. So, I wish somehow we could incorporate this into a uh, vocational school, you know, kids in schools, when you're thinking about what they want to do to somehow tap into what brings you joy, what yeah. do you really enjoy doing? And, 
Yeah, I'm sure they do on some level, but not as deep as what I think they could do. I think so too. And I think it would be amazing if people, you know, as you know, I, I'm sure you know, and you've heard it so many times, but when you die, the only thing you bring with you is your spiritual progress. You're not bringing your money. You're not bringing your car. You're not bringing how hard you worked out and got all those muscles. None of that comes with you. And it doesn't matter anymore. It doesn't even exist. So the only thing we get to bring with us is our spiritual progress. And I, it's funny because I, my whole business sole priority is about helping people, you know, two things. One, I have people that I help heal. And then I have pe people that I help build their business or grow their business. And then I do personal development workshops in, in other businesses and organizations. But the whole thing I think of is like a carrot, like a giant carrot. Like if I told my clients and I have for years, I tried this, you should meditate, you should pray or pray, pray. You should do a mantra. You should do the rosary, like whatever works for you to tune into God. And I'll tell you what, if that worked, it would have worked, but people forget, they get busy. They do it for a day or two. And now I've kind of like, and now actually the download came through me of the four soul archetypes. They're the connector, reflector, expander, and creator. And through those archetypes, you, we have all of them in us and we can actually use them in our daily life to earn our living. And it's kind of like this reverse thing of instead of saying you should pray and meditate and, 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 you know, tune in with God because it's the best thing for you. I've sort of created this path for people of, well, if you live your soul assignment and we monetize it, then you're living and tune with your soul all the time. And you're making money doing what you're here to do. So the money, when you leave this world, when you die, goes away and it never mattered in the first place. But if I could just help get people connected to their soul. So I think of the money as like a big carrot they're chasing. It doesn't matter. And I tell them that right away. Money doesn't exist. Don't ever chase money. However, we need However. it. To However, yeah. it's here on this plane of existence in this little world we're in. So if you could make money doing what you absolutely love and what God intended for you, then go do that. Yeah. And I went to college to do what I felt I was meant to do, you know, work with abused kids. Yeah. And I graduate college and I start out at $6 and 68 cents an hour. <laughs> oh my God. This is back in 91, 92, $6 and 68. I quit work and making four dollars an hour to go to college and then make six sixty-eight. You know, I was making double that within a few years, but still, you know, it wasn't enough to support a household. No. It was a side income, and everybody was doing side incomes that worked there because it didn't, you know, you didn't get paid enough. And so, and you know, then other people would take a different degree, go to the same school just as long as I did, and they're making a whole lot more money. And I'm like, wait a minute, did I do what I was supposed to do? Because, you know, I'm really poor now. You know, it works out, you know, you you, you grow. and But still, you know, I, I would see my boys, my teenage boys, their friends would be graduating school and going to work at the plants and making mm -hmm. three, four times what I was making after going to college, working at the plant. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, I don't know about my priorities anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so now my my grandkids are teenagers and they were talking about careers and I'm thinking do I tell them to follow their passion or do I say look to see what pays the most I mean what do you yeah, do I, I love it when it, I want to I like it when it lines up and you do both and you get paid right. really well for what you're doing yeah that's that's just, the perfect thing it is it is. I think it's, I think it's possible. I think that our world isn't, I, I feel like our world is set up in a multiple choice world, right? We go to school, we have to have the right answers. We learn things, but it has to be the right answer. And then when you get out of school, you have multiple choice of what you can do in life, right? You go to college, you could pick these degrees or you could pick these jobs. And it's like, but what if you created something new in the world? Or what if we all started, not all, but people like me who are more entrepreneurial started creating things so that more people had more opportunities. Because I, I feel like we've limited ourselves and we live in this lack mentality of there's not enough for everybody when really, you know, there is. It, it, you think God can't handle creating more green pieces of rectangular paper, green and white little papers yeah. you know, that we call money. God yeah. can handle all of that. And when I was living at careers, there's no no such thing as an end to e podcast. <laughs> right. <That's> <laughs> <laughs> I would have chose that. Right, right. And now such thing as me. <laughs> I know. Yeah. Uh, and now look at you. So yeah. it's just yeah. and when I was in grade school, I remember my aunt saying, 
what are you going to do when you grow up? And I said, what do you mean? Like, and I'm going to be just like a mommy, like my mom is. Well, no, you could have a job. And I said, what's my choices? Oh, you could be a secretary, a teacher, or a nurse. Which do you want to be? And I'm like, yeah, I don't be none of those. Right. And so going through high school, I still thought those was my only choices. <laughs> Nobody's yeah. told us, okay, these are all the different careers out there. What do you want to do? Or do you want to create something new like you have that the world didn't have before you started doing that? And I think that's such important work. Yeah, I wish they did more of those programs where you create your own program. You know, oh, say, I want to do this off the wall thing. Well, you would need this class and this class, but then where are you going to work? Are you going to start your own business? What are you going to do? I don't know. I live I live in a, a world of possibilities, not reality. <laughs> no, I mean, that's, but we create our own reality. So, you know, if somebody told me that I would be a number one international bestseller right now coming from, you know, God, I was dyslexic um, by college. I was, I, I, you know, went to junior college first and I remember getting tested for dyslexia because when I was in third grade, I got tested and they're like, oh, she's dyslexic. I didn't know what that was, but they put me in what's called the resource room. So I was in a room with kids with, um, you know, very special needs, um, and, and it wasn't helping. And I, so I just thought I was dumb at the same time. I'm being abused by one of my teachers and being bullied at school. So it was just a nightmare. And when I look back on that little girl who just literally survived and told her, you're going to one day be a number one international bestselling author, I would have laughed because at the time when I got to college, they tested me again for dyslexia because I needed, I, I needed to prove it again to get special help there. And I was reading at the third grade level or reading or spelling, spelling at the third grade level. Yeah. I could read, um, you know, but I mean, you wouldn't know it. I, I, I guess I, I could cover it up pretty well. Like I was getting, you know, at the time, I, I think that year I got pretty decent grades in college classes, but you asked me to spell something, you know, before Google, <laughs> I was out of school, high school, 10 years before I went to college, but I had thought about it off and on between there. And my mom brought my um, grade card and this letter from the school or something from testing. It said, the only thing I would be good at is crafts. Hmm. And so she would make fun of me. You can't go to college. Why don't you go to cosmetology and learn how to fix my hair? You can't go to college. You're too dumb to go to college. And actually I went to in high school, um, guidance counselor, I started thinking I wanted to be a psychiatrist. And I asked him if I could have pamphlets or, you know, information on how a person would do that. And he says, that's not for you. He says, you're not smart enough. Mm -hmm. And also too, I was poor. And so I didn't know about grants. I didn't know poor kids went to college for free. Nobody told me that. Mm -hmm. And so I thought well, I wouldn't. And so you think the only way you could go to college if you went to military. And I thought, well, if I went to the military, I'd have to be a conscious objector because I don't believe in killing people. And so the, I don't want to go through that. And and I don't want, like being told what to do. So that's not going to go good. <laughs> so, yeah, that all works out how it's to. It does, but it doesn't. I feel like I feel like during the time that we're here, we can open things up more. I feel like, you know, the people that feel like they're here to do something more or bigger, they need to start. Because, I mean, listening to to that, it's so sad. And kids are hearing that today and they're going to grow up believing that we live in this very limited world. So we're going to believe in an infinite God that can do anything, but we're limited here. And that doesn't make sense to me. It never made sense to me. Right. So then we just need to create more opportunities. And instead it's like somebody should have said, oh my gosh, that's great. You want to do crafts. You're, you're an artist. You should just have your own business. Right. But you weren't supported in that. I was an excellent seamstress. I won awards for my sewing. Wow. I mean, it's but, like, could you have been a fashion designer? Like, I mean, I think that you landed exactly where you are, but that allows us to have this conversation right now to hopefully get somebody inspired to live the life that they're meant to live, live a bigger life, the, the one they're feeling inside, like I'm meant for more, but I got to get there. And I feel like more people just need to start doing that because yeah, life- I was, I was working at my seamstress job actually. And one mm -hmm. day this woman, she was in her sixties and I was 28. And she just whips around out of the blue, totally out of character one day. And she says to me, get, get got my face. I turned it over her sewing machine over to me. And she said, 
you need to get out of here and go to school. You're young enough to do it. So do it. And she turned right back around and started sewing. It was just like, what possessed her? And I thought, yeah. You know, my mom always discouraged it. It was one person that said, go to college. And that's all I needed. So I called my friend. And I said, hey, I want to go to college. You want to go with me? She's okay. She goes, what do you want to take? She goes, I'll take whatever you take. So I had somebody to go along with me to visit colleges, look at different degrees. And so she took what I took and she ended up becoming a juvenile probation officer. Wow. And she had no intention or desire to become that, but she ended up, you know, she retired from it. Wow. (laughs) Amazing. That one woman, her intuition to talk to you affected both your lives and then all the kids' lives that you both affected. Yeah. I, after I graduated college, I went back to the store to find her, to thank her and tell her I went and stuff. And she had retired. Oh. But they said they she comes in now and then they said they would tell her. I said, let her oh know that God. I listened to her and I did that. That's beautiful. Yeah. yeah. Don't you wish I there's somebody I wish there was a counselor I saw after I was abused at school and they sent me to counseling. And I just wish I could go back to and thank this woman. I wish, you know, she was probably a new grad. <laughs> just you know, she was really young and just, I look back and I'm like, you know, there's like one thing she said to me when I was, I was in fifth grade. And she said, when you're older, I want you to go back to counseling. You're going to need it. And you know what I did? Everything hit again, right? All the memories, all the gory details started to come out again. And yeah, I was so glad I'm, I look back and I'm like, that woman just saved my life. Don't know who she is. It's funny. Um, that counselor, that school that I talked to was a junior high counselor, even though I was in high school, I had talked to him. And, um, but then later I went and talked to the high school counselor, not about that because I already give up. Okay. I'm too dumb. I, I'm poor. I can't go. But he, that the high school counselor started telling me, he says, I think you would be a good nurse. He says, I turned in all the paperwork and you've got this money coming in. I never heard of grants for poor kids and that. So I didn't know what he's talking about. He's like, oh, this money going to come in. We even pay for you to get a car, an apartment, everything. And I thought, he's a liar. That government don't pay for stuff. He has he have my information or anything in. That's what he said. He filled it out for me because I was on ADC, a dependent children. He knew that, I guess, because of free lunch, maybe. But he says, I got everything set up. And you need to be a nurse. I can see you as a nurse. And I just scoffed at him. I thought that's not going to happen. I don't know what he's talking about. But then later on, I was working at Children's Services and some girls accused him of things at school. And I told the other investigator, take it. I said, because I can't be on that case because I just love that counselor. And so um, I don't know how that all turned out. But so years later, I'd left Children's Services. I'm working at the hospital and I just had a craving one day. I never went and got a milkshake. But I didn't a milkshake so I went to the snack shop I'm in line to get a milkshake and I overhear the woman talking to the lady checking her out and here it's his wife that counselor's wife and he's in the hospital he just had both legs amputated from diabetes oh. and I said do you think I could go talk to him because I think he might have lost his job because of those false allegations from those girls and I'm thinking, I want him to know, because everybody knew I worked in this county, or I worked on service, that maybe that make him feel good. No, I didn't hold that against him. I didn't believe whatever. And, she, and I just says, can I go see him? And she goes, oh, he would love that. Me so much to him. And so I got to go up and thank him just for, you know, listening to me the time I come in upset and being there for me. And and his face just lit up. Here he has just got his legs removed, you know, and his whole face is, I, mean, I could tell it meant a lot for me to come in work and had worked at children's services, you know, and I just adored him and he knew it. So it was just strange how those things just fit together. Those are the moments though. Those are the moments that matter, you know, of all the things we do in this world, in our life, like those are the moments that when you leave this world, when we die, that's what matters. That's what, that's what the universe God is watching, you know? And And I told him, I remembered one day I went in his office, I threw my books down. I said, I quit. And he said, he could have just signed me out. Okay, fine, you quit. But he said, you know, he says, you've changed schools a lot. You've had to change friends and I understand. And he said, I'm going to leave you some time to yourself. I went there angry and mean and mad. And uh, he flipped the closed overs and turned off the lights. So it was dim in there. And he walked away. I went and got lunch or coffee break or something. Left me in his office. And I'm like, and I cried. Like I never cried back then because it was so sweet of him just give me some time alone. And that I was just touched my heart that he Mm -hmm. was sensitive to like, and dimming the lights till to this day, I'm upset, dim the lights and I'll chill way out. 
Mm. It's just, and it was just like the perfect, and I had this like a uh, spiritual experience sitting there. I seen this coll- a kaleidoscope, yeah. like all these um, flowers and figures. And, and, and I was remembering all these memories of every nice thing everybody ever did for me, wow. which were few. But I was seeing this nice thing this bus driver said, this nice thing this preacher said, this nice thing is, and this and this. And it was like forming. And then it was done. I was like, I knew who I wanted to be. I wanted to be a nice person like all those people. Yeah. You know, he became a role model. Like, this is how you treat people. Yes. That's exactly it. That's beautiful. It's almost like a life review, but you didn't have to die that time. Yeah. Yeah. That's beautiful. Yeah. I wish everybody could just experience who they really are. You know, I wish there was a way for everybody just to get that glimpse of who they really are, because I think the world would just be a very different place if they really understood the love inside of their own hearts, if they really felt it, you know, but we, yeah. Yeah. So I think it's awesome what you're doing. Um, and you. you know, to find out where you fit and go forward. Thank you. It's been a journey. You know, I, it hasn't been easy. It's been, you know, it's, it's interesting. I think you come back from a near death experience. And I think I really didn't tell a lot of people at first, but when I did felt like, again, there was like some expectations of what are you going to do with that? And I'm like, well, first of all, I have to be able to stand up and walk and, you know, talk. And so that took a long time to get healthy and have the strength to be able to work. And, you know, it's not like you come back with like a website and a marketing plan or whatever. Like you don't come back knowing how to do business. You're just like, okay, I have or to do write a thing. book <laughs> or write a book or anything. Right. And, and it's, um, it's daunting. It's daunting. And I, but I, that's part of what I want to do now is I try to like make it simple for people who want to monetize their gift or their message who are like, yeah, I do want to earn some money doing what I do or whatever. I just feel like if we could just simplify that in the world, you know, whether you're getting a job um, and you can work from one of your archetypes and you'll just do better. I've had clients make more money at their job. It's, it's just, again, it's money is just green and white rectangular pieces of paper. And we put a cap on how much we think we can have based on what we believe. And if you know, if I told people that the, you know, the, the, the path to wealth was to, um, you know, get a bunch of succulents growing in your yard or in your house, it would be really easy, right? Succulents, you just break them and they start growing again. <laughs> Great. I'll go do that. Right. But we call it money and we have this judgment on it. And then we end up living lives that are almost sometimes I think parallel to our soul assignment, because we don't think we're quite good enough to actually go all in on what we're here to do, or we don't have the resources or we don't have the moral support right? Or just our system of education isn't set up for the people who want, who don't want A, B, and C, but they want, you know, X, Y, Z over there. And there's no support for those kids. So yeah, if there's anything, you know, that I think as people who have seen the other side can take away, it's just, you know, live an intentional life and be abundant. There's no cap. These rules, I always say like the rules the rules are great. The rules that keep you safe are great until they keep you stuck. And so a lot of rules keep us stuck, right? Like not running out in traffic. That's a good rule. The golden rule is like live. rich people are mean and selfish. Rich you know? people are mean. That's stuck. not, that's not true. That's not true. Um, you know, my mom was the most mean, too. selfish person I've ever known in my life. <laughs> she wasn't rich. I never was rich. <laughs> no. I mean, there's there's money that people help do so many things with, and I think and she did come into money once in a bad, shady way, and she was just being hateful then too. It's sad. It's not the money. It's the people, and people. There are people out there giving you know thousands or hundreds of thousands away to charities, and you might never hear about yeah. them, but they're out there. And and then we've sort of put this, but the judgment isn't necessarily on us. I think the judgment is more of a block so that we don't become rich, right? It's not, if I say, oh, rich people are bad, that doesn't do anything to the rich people. It does something to me with my words, my thoughts, my feelings. That just blocked me from coming into abundance. A lot of poor people are bad too. (laughs) Exactly. People are just people, right? Depending on where their level of consciousness is, what they do with their day, how intentional they are about living, they're just people, 
right? There, I think, I think for the most part, people are doing their best. Um, some of them maybe <laughs> not so much, and some of them are pulling the weight of you know ten people. But you know, it's not for me to judge. We're just having our journey here, and it's it's a beautiful journey. So, well, thank you. It has been very nice meeting you. Thank and, you. And uh, wish all the best with your adopted daughter. Thank you. You too. So good chatting. I, we got to chat before the show, and it was so good getting to know you. And thank you for having me on. It's been fun. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you. I'll send this out to you later. So it's available. Be a couple of days yet. Okay. Thank you. Are you still? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Perfect. Well, I, I look forward to seeing it. Okay. All right. Okay. Bye. -bye. Bye.